Here in Limerick, the locals will have us believe that we are in Ireland's home of storytellers. Whether that is true or not, it doesn't really matter, because it's a good story. In fact, a lot of good stories have come from Limerick, but that is because a lot of good storytellers have came from here. Educated here at an impoverished Leamy school in the 1940s, Frank McCourt had a less romantic view of Limerick at that time. Frank McCourt experienced hardship here on Barrack Hill. We spoke with Dominic Taylor, a writer from Limerick, who expressed an opinion on McCourt. So how would you describe Frank McCourt's depiction of Limerick in Angela's Ashes? In terms of the social deprivation, it was typical of all cities in Ireland and Europe in the 1930s. He describes the living conditions here in Limerick very well. The slums, the overcrowding, the lack of sanitary facilities, etc. But in terms of the social conscience dominated by religion and the Catholic Church, who controlled their flock, as they like to refer to them, um, with charity and the threat of damnation in the afterlife. In my song, which I wrote from the book, I say, in the city of Limerick that's ruled by the bell, only living for eternity. I think that's very true. He also depicted Limerick in terms of its people. And I believe that the human spirit in general has been indomitable, getting on with it, making the best of what we have. The humour in the midst of pain, suffering and inequality is a defining character of how Limerick comes across in the book. Well, sometimes the truth is pretty hard to bear. But there are some legitimate concerns about what he wrote, uh, but that's the nature of memoir. Uh, it's not straight autobiography. In memoir, the writer is interpreting his life through his own subjective memory. The re and the reader is invited in to feel and be affected by what happens to protagonist. All memoir, to a certain extent, is fiction anyway. Unfortunately for McCourt, all the characters he described in his book had not died and the glaring omissions of not changing people's names uh, in the text left him wide open to criticism and contradiction of events. Uh, I think this omission is probably an indication of how his publishers felt about the book initially. Initially, they didn't expect it to be a worldwide bestseller and open to such scrutiny. In McCourt's subsequent memoirs, you can see in, from the acknowledgements that some of the names have been changed. I think this is why some locals loved it and some hated it and felt he discredited Limerick and some of its citizens. He gave his distractors ammunition to fire at him, but ultimately this helped the sales of the books worldwide. Remember that 10 years previously, Frank and his brother Maliki uh, put on a review in the bell table which lar with largely the same content as Angela's Ashes called The Irish and How They Got That Way, and it was ignored by the public who subsequently vehemently opposed the book. It seems that as long as we can keep quiet and don't let the neighbours know how we live, it's okay. I think, and I think we have seen how this policy has played out in other areas of Irish life and how it ultimately comes back to bite you. The Irish are, are storytellers anyway, right? and I think Frank epitomised that. He was a great storyteller and he honed his craft as storyteller in his class, classrooms in uh, New York as a teacher. And uh, what these pupils liked, if they liked them, he knew there were good stories and I think uh, he transferred an awful lot of that feedback that he got from his students into the book. We are at the ancestral home of 19th century romantic poet Aubrey de Vere. Although he was educated in Trinity College, Dublin. De Vere was highly influenced by his surroundings here in Corrichase. His writings are massively influenced by Corrichase here that we see around us. To gain a deeper insight into the effect Limerick had on Aubrey de Vere, we spoke with local historian Dr. Maura Cronin. So Maura, I'm just wondering, um, what effect did Aubrey de Vere have on Corrichase? Well, I suppose in terms of the estate itself, he was, well, he was just one of the family and the family itself were uh, very uh, assiduous in beautifying the estate and putting plantations in and the artificial lake that was eventually, you know, put there. Um, but I suppose in the wider context, they were 
good landlords. In fact, most landlords were actually good landlords in spite of the folklore, um, would have been very careful about their estate, uh, would have been very much aware of the condition of the tenants. And, um, I mean, for instance, during the famine, they would have taken a very active role in relief of hunger, uh, along with the local Protestant and Catholic clergy. So they had a positive effect on Limerick itself as a whole? Oh, I would have thought so. And in effect, the family would have had their influence reaching beyond the estate in that there were various members of them involved in Limerick institutions. Like Stephen Devere would have been one of the governors of the what was then called the Lunatic Asylum. They were very conscious of, of poverty, um, humane in their treatment. A very old style, of course, because mm -hmm. they, they saw themselves as the natural leaders of society. And in a way, all of them, Aubrey included, and his uh, brother Stephen would have been a bit uneasy about, if you like, the democratisation of society as you move into the end of the 19th century. Um, and so they, it wasn't heard of that there were such a hierarchy of people were nice to the local. Oh, absolutely. I mean, and in a sense, I suppose then Aubrey and his brother Stephen had an additional link with the locality in that both of them converted to Catholicism um, in the around the 1840s. So they would have attended Mass locally, which would have been in Robertstown. And later on then, they would have been instrumental in building the church in Foynes, the small little Catholic church in Foynes. So they were very much a part of the, the locality, even though, of course, they were elevated, if you like, above the, the mass of people there. Mm -hmm. And he wrote so much about Limerick himself, poetry? Well, he did. And I think as well, he was influenced by, I suppose, the beauty of Cora Chase and, of course, typical of many of the poets of his time, he was very conscious of nature and that comes into his poetry quite a lot. Um, it wouldn't have been unique in that of course, but I think the, the landscape and the estate and I suppose the genre of poetry uh, in which he was involved were all part of the shaping of his own poetry. Mm -hmm. And did he have any massive impact on Limerick? Is there anything big that he did? or? I'm putting you on the yeah, spot here now. I, I don't think there, no, that's not demeaning the man. I don't think there's anything one can pick out. Yes. Um, he would have been, as I say, part of that very benevolent gentry, which were known, I think, retrospectively more than at the time, as the Shannon set. You know, so you'd have had a number of landlords from the Clare side, the O'Briens of Drumoland. You would have had, uh, obviously, the De Veres. You'd have had uh, Lord Mondeagle um, out in Glynn. Um, you'd have had... Um, Adair, the Adair people. Uh, so they were very much part of the forward-looking, modernising, pretty benevolent um, landlord caste of the time. And then politically, of course, they would all have been unionist, but, but, but in a very reasonable way, and, and uh, would have been again a little bit shaken by changing attitudes and political approaches as you enter the 20th century. De Vere died here in 1902. But Limerick was not left without another great writer, because less than five miles away was the young Kate O'Brien. Mulgrave Street, the place where Kate O'Brien had her childhood, was known locally as the Road of Life, because it housed a prison, a lunatic asylum, and a graveyard. In other words, all forms of human life. So we were brought up in a roomy red brick house on the outskirts of Limerick. The grandfather had built in the, in the 1870s. Uh, it was an ugly looking house, big brick house with um, a hideous monkey puzzle tree outside and it was rather near the dusty road. Kate O'Brien is the quintessential Limerick writer. Although she depicts Limerick in a harsh light, her impressions of it is beautiful. According to literary academic Dr. Catherine Lang, O'Brien had a deep affection for Limerick. Dr. Lang, can you speak about the impact Kate O'Brien had on Limerick? Yes, I can, and actually there's uh, quite a lot of recent scholarship starting to, to uh, focus on uh, the importance of Limerick in her uh, life and her writing life in particular. So Limerick had a massive impact on her work as well? And it did. Uh, several of her novels uh, uh, draw on those experiences. I think the very familiar ones, Land of Spices, that people know a lot about. The Anteroom uh, is another novel that uh, I think people will be very familiar with. 
Pray for the Wanderer as well and Mary Lavelle. The limerick, which features as Melik, uh, uh, is, is important in those works. I think it was a difficult time for many writers who were engaging with topics that were considered taboo at the time, not just Kate O'Brien. If we think uh, about uh, the, the publishing world in, in England where she eventually settled, um, Radcliffe Hall's Well of Loneliness, which was published in 1928, uh, and D.H. Lawrence's Lady Chatley's Lover, uh, just a year afterwards, both of those books faced censorship in England at the time. So. O'Brien wasn't the only one to face censorship, her books were censored and in Ireland it was a hostile climate uh, for the kind of writing and the kind of subjects that she wanted to explore. Well, a lot of her, her fiction, uh, in particular a novel like The Ante Room, actually uh, was very popular at the time. Uh, she, she was well uh, and highly regarded uh, and has, it has been reissued by publishers hold that up such a, such a farrago um, uh, and is still in print and, and popular uh, so at the time the hostility to her work some of it was um, ideological uh, now uh, that popularity has 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 remains I think amongst a broad readership but scholars have paid attention to her as a uh, pioneer writer um, in, in, in many ways and and to the way in which uh, she, her imagination was shaped, has been shaped by her experiences of growing up in Ireland, growing up in Limerick, uh, uh, and her 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 courage in, in uh, taking on the subjects, exploring those within those contexts. So, I think she's always been well well regarded, but has it's taken time for her to be accepted into the literary canon um, to some extent. Uh, but she she's very much there. And, uh, She, she was perhaps a, a wanderer in herself as well, the, that, the, the title of the novel, Pray for the Wanderer. She, she travelled, uh, she spent time in Spain, uh, which is explored in Mary Lavelle. Um, uh, she moved to, to England, yes, and came back to Ireland, so perhaps that wandering instinct was, was part of what made her a writer as well. Uh, but the difficulties of, of uh, Irish society probably um, were, were contributed to that, that state of restlessness. So she has left a large legacy. Oh yes, oh yeah, definitely, and uh, one to be celebrated. A writer is someone who throws himself or herself at the head of the public and asks to be listened to. We confront you with our conceptions of human life and our recreations and inventions from life as we see it, and if those inventions and recreations please you or interest you at all, I suppose it's rather natural to, for us to talk to you sometimes about how we arrive at our strange profession and what we find to be the difficulties or the satisfactions of the work we do. As you have seen, these three Limerick-born writers have been inspired by their native city. That inspiration brought them and their hometown global attention in all of its forms. Three international writers who have expressed their feeling about their native city and are loved by all of the world. This is not such a bad claim to fame for a small city in the Republic of Ireland. That puzzling reflection really sums up uh, one's career as a writer. Whatever you do, you know, good or bad, you've only yourself to blame. The phrase exasperates me because it fills me with a sense of time lost often and work undone. However, for all of that, well, always it's true one has only oneself to blame. And from life, from outside, I've, I have received, I must say, as a writer, an enormous amount of help and encouragement, and encouragement from the right places, and great friendship from many people who've been associated with my work. The trouble is that one feels one's put so very little back into life and just turned for what one got out of it. <laughs>